we at? Let's see. This morning we are in First John, and we're talking about maturity in the Christian life. Uh, this is where um, John is going to begin to come into this area of maturity. Now, of course, prior to this, he's been talking about a few things. One of the last week we were talking about the fact that we have a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. You know, have we had opportunity throughout this week to express love towards another saint? You know, that's something that John is really um, focused on that because especially when you understand, you know, the general context and the time and when he wrote this book, he's in Ephesus, you know, he's part of that. And what was the big thing that Ephesus kind of lost? Uh, yeah, their first love, which was the love for the brethren, you know, and they, and they tended to lose that because there were a lot of false teachers coming in, false apostles and other stuff like that. Now, they, they weeded them all out but they kind of lost their love for the brother at the same time, you know, and that's something that is very important. You know, we need to express a proper love towards other saints. So how have we applied the new commandment throughout this week, this last week, you know, we were talking about it. How did we actually apply it to our lives? You know, was there opportunity to apply it to our lives? Um, oftentimes there is, you know, sometimes by the way, this doesn't have to be a grand thing. It can be a simple thing. You know, it's just expressing concern or care or seeking, ultimately seeking the best for the one love. That's what it is. You know, it's not some grand gesture that we have to do to satisfy the commandment of God, just being in the body of Christ. We walk in the light by doing, not by saying. He was talking about that also, because, you know, he's saying, if you are one who says, walk in the light, or I abide, he, we actually have both that he was dealing with, but you don't actually love the brethren, you're not walking in the light, you're walking in the darkness. And more specifically, he said, if you're indifferent to the brethren. And indifferent, of course, that term means that you don't really have a concern for them. Again, indifference, and oftentimes our word uh, hate is translated, is, uh, it's a translation of the word indifferent, and it has a slightly different meaning to it, because it's saying you could care less whether they're successful or not. You just don't care about the person. One way or the other doesn't mean anything to you. So then, of course, the question comes up, are we walking in the light? Are we seeing things as they really are? Are we applying it to our lives? You know, in First John, right from the very beginning, he talks about the one who walks in the light has fellowship with other saints. But the one who's walking in the darkness, even though they say they're walking in the light, they're, they're actually walking in darkness. You can't walk in darkness and be in the light. It's, it's impossible. You can't have both. So indifferent towards other saints shows that one is walking in the darkness. That will be one of those examples. Now, again, that's not something to say, oh, I'm supposed to love the brethren and I'm not loving the brethren, so I got to go take care of this. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about one who's characterized as doing this, as paying attention, um, as one who is fellowshipping with God, not manifesting the works of the flesh. So now as we come into the stages of maturity that he's going to be talking about here in 1 John chapter 2 and starting in verse 12. So these stages of, matur of maturity he's going to talk about are three different uh, stages that he's going to give us here. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12 st uh, starts out with, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for the sake of his name. Uh, verse 13 goes on, I write to you, fathers, because you experientially know the one from a beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the malignantly evil one. I write to you, little children, because you know the Father. So in looking at that in a little bit more detail and going back into what John is talking about here, we start out with the little children, because that's what he references at first. He says, you know, I write to you, little children. Okay, so he's talking about, of course, actively writing at this point. So the information he's going to be giving coming up is going to be related to specifically addressing um, Christians who are, in this case, described as ones who are children, but they're little. It's actually a word, uh, paideia. It's, it's, it's an affectionate term, and that's why you get little children. 
And he's talking about really the level of maturity that they have in the Christian life at this point. And he focuses on the fact that their sins have been forgiven. And that's, of course, an important thing for probably one of the first things we really need to begin to understand when we become a Christian is that our sins are actually forgiven. You know, Christ actually paid for those. And the, of course, impact of that should be we live a righteous life, not we go and say, okay, well, we can just continue to sin. That's completely misunderstanding what God did. You know, so a proper understanding of that is really important. When it comes to this little children, we see a lot of areas in scripture where this is actually used specifically towards Christians. Um, it's interesting that God uses it, or more specifically Christ in his humanity, in John chapter 13 and verse 33. Now, this is addressing the disciples on the day of his death. Okay, he actually addresses them with the term, my little children. Now, I don't think he's being disrespectful to them at all in the context that doesn't justify that by any means. But he's talking to ones who, at this point, they don't really have a whole lot of understanding about the Christian life. The Christian life hasn't even really come to a point to where we can actually access it because we need the resurrection of Christ. But he's at this point, he is about to die, and he's giving them information specifically about the new relationship we're going to have. So in John chapter 13, verse 33, he says, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you. So in addressing them, now, of course, in verse 34 and 35, he actually gives a new commandment. Love one another. So he's beginning to give them new information. And in the context, that's what he's talking about. He's realizing that they haven't grown and they haven't matured because at this point, their, Christ, their, their spiritual life really isn't at, well, it's not. Because until, you, until, what am I actually trying to say? I'm stumbling around my words here. What I'm saying is they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. The, the indwelling Holy Spirit isn't there yet. They don't possess eternal life yet, but they're about to. And he's given them information, and they're going to learn. And it's the same thing with us. You know, prior to believing that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day, we didn't have spiritual life. We don't have the Holy Spirit. But after that, we do. And we begin to grow and learn. And that's what he's talking about here. We also see it in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, of course, encouraging to stop sinning. You know, and this is in the context of which we were just in, or we actually are in. Uh, so 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And really the way that he's expressing not sin is so that you stop sinning, that you're not doing that. Now in the, in the context there, he's been talking about the fact that if we sin, we can confess our sins and God is going to cleanse us. And then he goes on to even talk about the fact that we have an advocate before the Father. So when we sin, it's not about us being remorseful. It's about us acknowledging who we are in Christ, calling that sin for what it actually is, and putting on the proper defense so we're walking in the light, not in the darkness. You know, Christ deals with it before the Father. And, and I'm not saying that you know when we sin, we won't feel bad about it. We won't be remorseful. What I'm saying is how remorseful you are doesn't matter that in relation to the forgiveness of your sins. Christ already dealt with that. And it doesn't matter in the relationship of fellowship because, again, he's the advocate. You want a fellowship with God, you walk in the light. You apply the truth. You have victory over the sin nature, and you're going to walk in. in you're going to walk in the light and therefore have fellowship with other saints. So here he is talking about the fact that if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. He deals with that. Again, he's referring to little children here. So this is one of those things that as a, as a Christian who's not really mature, by the way, this is not referring to somebody who's necessarily only been a Christian for a year or two years. This could be somebody who's been a Christian for 20, 30 years and never, never grew. 
never got the truth, never understood the fact that their sins actually are forgiven. You know, that that was laid to rest and, and it's not a weight that they need to be putting on their shoulders because it doesn't belong to them anymore. You know, they can begin to grow and mature and live a life that glorifies God. Very important uh, aspect of the beginning of the Christian life. First John chapter 2 and verse 12, of course, understanding sins are forgiven, which is where we're at. You know, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. It's based upon his name that they're forgiven. Again, it doesn't go back to how serious you are about repenting in the sense of feeling remorseful. Repent actually means to change the mind. It's talking about the fact that our sins are forgiven and we should begin to grow as a result of that. We also, as little children, need to learn to abide in Christ. We need to learn to begin to feel at ease in this new relationship that we have with God. Because the more we feel at ease in it, the more we're going to tend to use it. It's when we're not comfortable with it, we're going to tend to go back to who we were prior and try to do things that way. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. And now, little children... Abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And now he's talking about when he comes here and he takes us, uh, it's also referred to as a rapture, or the snatching away of the church is, is what he's referring to. When he comes, we shouldn't be standing before him ashamed. And the only way we would do that, by the way, is if we're not feeling at ease in who we are in Christ. If we're feeling at ease with who we are in Christ, we are going to understand he has dealt with the sin aspect. He's given us righteousness and uh, well, he's applied righteousness to us and he's given us the Holy Spirit and access to eternal life so we can manifest it. You, know, it. you don't have to do great things. You just have to be a Christian. That's all you need to be. You know, and I'm talking about great things in the, in the realm of what the world would consider great. You know, somebody who stands in front of millions and brings uh, thousands to the Lord by giving them the gospel. You know, if God called you to do that, awesome. But it might be that he just called you to just live a, a life that glorifies God in the face of a bunch of unbelievers who never believe but you're actually doing what is right. You know, feel at ease with who you are in Christ. Uh, begin to understand the new relationship that we have with God. A good example of that is how you communicate to God. I mean, think about it. You know, If you're not feeling at ease with God, how are you going to communicate? You're going to communicate in a completely different way if you're feeling at ease. You know, God's dealt with my sin. You know, maybe I should be more focusing on manifesting righteousness than feeling sorry for what happened in the past. Learning to love in actions and not words. First John chapter 3 and verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deeds and in truth. You know, seeing things as they really are. How often do people say that they love or say that they care, but when it comes to actually manifesting them, there is no manifestation of it. You know, the reality is we shouldn't have to say it. We need to show it through our actions. And if we're saying it and we're not showing it through our actions, are we walking in the light? We're not walking in the light. We're walking in the darkness. We got to manifest that, and that's really important. So, a little child, as we grow and we mature, we're going to begin to learn to not just talk about it, but actually begin to do it, begin to apply it. You know, and to be honest with you, especially as you as you grow and mature in the Christian life, sometimes you're just not going to do a very good job of it, and that's okay. And we don't have to be perfect every single time. We grow and we mature, and that's what he's talking about, learning how to love. Begin to learn that God is greater than Satan. Do you actually really understand that? The world system is designed by Satan to control humans. 
Now, it's primary, primarily used to control unbelievers, but it can also be true. Uh, it can also be used to manipulate believers into fear and other stuff like that. But the reality is, God is greater than Satan. First John chapter four and verse four. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You actually have the ability to overcome Satan. And that's, of course, in the Christian life. What kinds of attacks does Satan bring? He wants independence from God. He wants fear. He wants confusion. He wants, you know, he'll bring the lies. He'll bring uh, discouragement, other things like that. We actually, in Christ, have the ability to overcome him. And, and we're talking an absolute overcoming in our lives where he brings that kind of garbage and we're like, no, we're not interested. How does fear impact the Christian life? I don't think I need to elaborate on that because that's really obvious how it, it impacts, isn't, isn't it? It'll cause you to do things that are independent from God. You know, and that's really something you need to be, we need to be very cautious about. We, we learn this as a, a young Christian, as one who is as at the first stages of maturity. We, we really need to understand these things to move on to the next stages of maturity. You know? Now, again, I said this isn't necessarily a Christian who's been somebody, you know, a little child. It's not necessarily somebody who's been a Christian for, let's say, a year or two years or something along those lines. There's a good example, as I was thinking about this of Christians who matured extremely fast comparatively. And that's in Thessalonians. The Thessalonians took to, God, to not only took and accepted the word that Paul brought, but began to manifest it so quickly it even stunned Paul. You know, and, and he was concerned that that would be shaken because he was ripped away from them. You know, he describes that as, as they were being orphaned from him, and they really were. He was beginning to, to grow and mature. But the amount of information those saints got in the short amount of time, they had less than four weeks. Absolutely incredible. And they were not just listening. They were applying it. They were using it. They were beginning to grow. This can happen at any time in the Christian life. We also have the fact that we need to learn to keep from idols. Again, this is one of those basic things in the Christian life. What are you putting up as an idol? First John chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, uh, Little children, keep, yourself from, keep yourselves from idols. It's a simple statement, but really, what is an idol? You know, where does idolatry come from? It's covetousness. Wanting what somebody else has. You know, the world system is all about that, isn't it? It's all about that. So, you know, sometimes we think of idols as like little statues and other things like that that people bow down to. And we still have those today. In the area we live, you know, there were a lot of Indians who had their totem pole idols. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Buddhists and, and other religions that have their little idols. But there's also other kinds of idols. Is money an idol to you? That so often is something that, that as uh, Americans as in, in the society we are in, there's a heavy focus on money, isn't there? Well, if we just had money, everything would be grand. Yeah. But that is so not true. Um, it's just, Idol yeah, over in Ezekiel, idolatry is in the heart. It goes down into the core of a person. Keep yourself from idols. Are you putting something above God? Are you putting a person above God? Are you saying that, you know, as a nation, we can't be a good nation unless a certain person leads the nation? then you're putting your, your hope in a person. You're not putting it in God. 
You know, it is as simple as that. Don't put idols up. You know, and again, I, idolatry comes from covetousness. It's seeking what somebody else has. You know, because idolatry, ultimately, it comes out of that because what are you doing when you're bowing down to something else? You don't want what God is offering. You want to basically justify your bad actions by saying, well, my God told me to do this. You know, how often do people actually use the name of Jesus in the same way? You know, don't know. We, we got to stay away from idols. Uh, and that's something, again... As a, a young Christian, as we're beginning to mature and grow in our Christian life, we begin to learn that. Stay away from those things. You know, begin to um, understand that you, your sins are forgiven. Start to abide in Christ. Start to love in action, not in words. Start putting action behind it. And then he goes on to talk about the young men. So back over in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 13, he goes on and he says, I write to you, fathers, because experientially you experientially know the one from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you overcome the malignantly evil one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. Now, of course, I want to focus on the young men here as he begins to talk about the next stage of growth. And probably the biggest uh, thing here is you have overcome the malignantly evil one. So the, the first stage is really beginning to understand who you are in Christ, what Christ has done, and primarily more of a focus on overcoming the sin nature, understanding that you have sinned, that you don't need to sin anymore, that you can stop sinning because of what Christ has actually done. That's the very beginning and now the, the next stage is really beginning to overcome Satan. Now, referring to as a young man. Now, it's interesting that he doesn't go on to a whole lot of other detail about this. He just says, you're ones who are having victory over Satan. And this is more of a characteristic of this person. The characterized ones that, that have learned and have grown to understand the, the desires that Satan is going to bring. And, and they're not falling for them. They're putting on the proper defense. They're understanding how to defend themselves against him. Uh, so you have, you know, the fact that they are ones who are strong. So uh, here, of course, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 13, it specifically says uh, you are having victory over Satan. By the way, the malignantly evil one that is referenced here is actually a title for Satan. Uh, Satan is not okay with just being bad all by himself. He has to spread it. And he wants everybody else to be involved with him. And that's what it's talking about. And they've overcome the malignantly evil one. They're not following him. And they're doing this because they're strong. They're strong, of course, in the Lord would be the context here and what he's talking about. You know, being strong in the Lord. And then in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 13, we come back to the fathers where he begins, he's writing to them and he says, I write to you fathers because you have experientially known the one from a beginning. Now he doesn't really say from the beginning as some of our translations uh, do kind of give us an indication. It's like you go all the way back to the beginning. He's talking about a beginning and he's talking about the Christian life in the context here. You know, fathers are referred to as ones that are mature, and we see good examples of this. Now, this is over in Acts chapter 22 and verse 1. We're not talking about Christian fathers here. We're actually talking about fathers in relation to Israel. But you get a good example of how this particular term is used in Scripture. So in Acts chapter, apparently I didn't put that up. Let me try that again. There it is. Acts chapter 2 and verse, Acts chapter 22 and verse 1. It says, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. Now, what's going on in the context is Paul is giving a defense because they thought he was coming to defile the temple. So he's addressing the Jewish people, but he addresses them as brethren and fathers. There's his father, his biological father isn't in the crowd. He's not talking to him. He's talking about those in Israel who are ones who are mature. He's addressing them. 
And then he goes on to talk about uh, ones who uh, the fathers have an experiential knowledge of God, a prior experiential knowledge of God. Um, these are the ones that have known him from the beginning. This isn't just about um, knowing that there's a God, but actually experiencing God. As we grow and we mature, we begin to actually experience God. It's not a head knowledge anymore. Now, remember, experiencing God isn't, isn't about hearing God audibly or a voice in your head or seeing him do things. How do we as Christians actually experientially know God? Isn't it manifesting the character of Christ? Isn't it living out our Christian life? Where you begin to understand the desires from the Holy Spirit are the righteous ones and not, you know, because that's really, of course, where our Christian life is involved in is the fact that the Holy Spirit impacts our very desires. And we begin to manifest the character of Christ. How do we, as, as Christians, know that we love God? John's going to deal with that also. If you say that you love God, how do you know that you love God? There has to be an experiential knowledge of loving the brethren, doesn't there? And he talks about that. So we experience God by living out the Christian life. So we begin to live it out, and we're, we're doing those things that are righteous. We're doing the things, well, really, it comes down to we're understanding what his desirous will is in, in all situations, and we're doing it. We're experiencing it. So he goes on to talk about those who are mature ones. So as we grow and we mature in, in our Christian life, it's important. And of course, these would be fathers. We're properly using wisdom. Now remember, wisdom is a proper use of knowledge. Uh, if you don't know something, you can't have wisdom in relation to that because you have to have knowledge in order to actually apply the wisdom correctly. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, However we speak wisdom among those who are mature, and not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So the world system actually has its wisdom. But we don't speak that kind of wisdom. Now in the context, he's talking about the fact that we're in Christ and what Christ has done. In the context of second of First Corinthians chapter two, he's talking about the things that never entered into the hearts of men that God actually showed us what was going to happen. He's talking about the fact in here that we actually have a quality of the mind of Christ. That's incredible. That's the wisdom that we should be applying based upon that knowledge. We mature in the process of, of giving careful consideration. To different things in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20 says, Brethren, do not be children. Now, this your word children here is paideia. Don't be little children in understanding. Your word understanding here actually literally means to um, give careful consideration to. Uh, is a better way of actually, this isn't your normal word that you would translate as understanding. So in your careful consideration, don't be little children. However, when it comes to malice, that's lacking in character. You certainly should be ones who are inarticulate babblers. You know, and remember, that's the guy who, you know, he, he kind of wants to act like he's cool, but he just not. <laughs> he just doesn't get it because he doesn't understand the things that relate to that particular subject. That's how we should be when it comes to things that lack in character. We just don't understand them. But in our understanding, again, our careful consideration, we should be ones who are mature. We should be properly taking the time to give consideration for things. We can, and we all, should grow to maturity, to full maturity. All of us as Christians can actually grow to full maturity. A full, full maturity doesn't mean, oh, I'm perfect and I've reached a stage where, where I can just kick back and relax and cruise through the rest of my life because I'm good. 
maturity is coming to a stage where predominantly you're living out the Christian life. It doesn't being mature doesn't mean you're you're not going to be stupid at times. We do have a human nature. Come on. You know. Um, sometimes we do things that are just bad, but we understand how to deal with them. We understand how to get that that course directed back to where it should be. Uh, Ephesians talks about this. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Till we all come to a unity of the faith. And remember that unity word means a oneness of the faith. There is only one faith. How do I know there's only one faith? Because faith is based upon a promise. And what promise do we have from God? We really have one promise, don't we? That goes back to the fact that if we believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day, he will save us. And that involves all the content of our salvation, but it's still only one thing. It doesn't go back to say, well, that's okay, but if you live by the law, I'll let you in also. No, Scripture doesn't say that. You know, not at all. There's only one. And to the knowledge, and this word knowledge here, by the way, is a full experiential knowledge. It's just not, it's not kind of knowing God. It's actually knowing him really well. And more specifically, it's the son of God. How do we know the son of God? Well, as the son of God begins to live his life out through us, we again are going to experience him. We're going to experience how to actually love a brother, love a fellow saint more specifically, because we're going to do it. We're going to learn how in situations where everybody else is in turmoil, we're in peace. Why? And I mean an unruffledness of mind. Oh, we have a good opportunity to experientially learn that today, don't we? To not have a uh, mind that's ruffled up. Wait, who's in control? God's the one in control. Who do we care or why would we care about somebody that holds a position of authority in the world system? If God doesn't want them there, what's going to happen? Yeah, they're simply not going to stay there. He could remove them in so many different ways. You know, don't, don't let your mind become uh, fearful. We don't need to have fear. We actually know God. But as you experientially know this, and this is where that experience comes from, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, we talk about that, the fruit of the Spirit. Have you actually expressed love, joy, peace, long-suffering? That's the experience part, you know, where we get to a situation to where it's not to say that I can do this without you, God, but I understand what we're going to do, and then let's do it, because I've been here before. And I understand exactly how I'm supposed to act in this situation. That's the experientially knowing God. To a mature, now this translation says, uh, this is the New King James, it says perfect. It is not saying that we become ones who do everything right all the time. It's talking about one who's mature, brought to a proper end. This is somebody who is actually in a stage in their Christian life where, again, predominantly, they live out their Christian life. A mature man to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Remember, our measurement that we go to is Christ. It is not another person. That's not what it's, you know, we don't look at the pastor. We don't look at anybody else and say, oh, I wish I was like that person. No, you don't. You wish you were like Christ. And really, you are like Christ. So how about you start acting like it instead of wishing? You know, that's the Christian life. That's involved in the Christian life. Having a proper frame of mind. Such an important aspect of the Christian life. And, and in growing and maturing. Because remember, that frame of mind directly impacts what you do. <clears throat> Philippians talks about this. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 15. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if anything, um, or if anyone thinks otherwise, God will reveal this to you. In the context, what is he talking about? He's come out of, you know, in the second chapter, he's talking about how Christ came, God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, came as a servant 
and submitted himself to the will of the Father, even to the point of death. Are we willing to do that? Or is the Christian life only about having a fat wallet and, and being happy? Or is it about, you know, doing what's right, and if that costs me everything, I'm still going to do what's right. Having the right attitude that we are servants of God, we belong to him. It's not about him serving us, it's about us serving him. It's about our lives glorifying him in, in whatever he chooses. Whether it's in life or whether it's in death, it shouldn't matter to us. One who is mature is able to understand the deep things of Scripture. And we all should be able to get to the point. You don't have to know the Greek, by the way, to really understand the deep things of Scripture. It helps. And we'll say it helps a lot. Because you're going back to the original. And, you know, especially like in my studying, when I go back and I, and I read it from the original and I'm understanding the original, when I speak it, I can say, you know, that this is what it says. It's not based upon what I think it says. This is actually what it says. And how is that supposed to be applied to my life? Uh, Hebrews talks about this. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. Well, your word full age is your word mature. It's the same word, by the way. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Well, understand what you're talking about good and evil here. You're talking about that which is lacking in character and that which is proper. Those are your true terms there. And you exercise. And yes, this is actually, if you ever wanted a passage in scripture where scripture says you have to go to the gym, this is the one. Actually, it uses the word for a gym. Okay, in, in the original, you get in there, you exercise, but you're exercising your senses to discern what is proper and what is not. Okay. As we mature, we should be able to do that and begin to, to look at any and all situations and understand that. One who is mature is going to be patient. Patience is a good thing. Like in the situation we are in today, should we be patient? In this situation, we should be. Our patience might have to last four years, but we should still be patient. You know, remember, patience is a focus on circumstances. Okay, we don't always understand everything that God's doing, but there are a few things we understand. You know, a good example of this is which way is the world system going to go? Is it going to go towards God or is it going to go away from Him? Okay. It's pretty clear from Scripture it's, it's not headed towards God. So is it a surprise when it shifts away from God and it wants to go to unrighteousness? It shouldn't be something that shocks us, but it's not going to change the reality of who God is and the fact that he's in control. You know, Even God himself says, I put the basis of men up into positions of authority. Why? So often people want that, and he's like, fine. Here you go. Reap the results of that. They don't like that part. You know, they, they want good, they want to, uh, they want all the good things, but they don't want the bad things. But let patience have its perfect work. Your word perfect there is mature. This is over in James, James chapter one and verse four. Have its mature work that you may be mature and lacking nothing. So it, patience, you know, again, just holding out under a circumstance, waiting for God to deal with the situation. You know, being patient. Not offending others with words. Oh, now here is a major one. Okay. I mean, this really is. How often does our tongue get away from us? Even ones who are very mature, that we live out the Christian life all the time, we're, and then all of a sudden our tongue just slips something out, you know, and, and it's it's really not beneficial to anybody that we do that. Being mature, you begin to learn to control your tongue. 
And of course, one of those would be to stop and think before you speak. You know, don't just speak it. Because a lot of times, it's not to say that what you're saying isn't necessarily accurate or true, but is it beneficial to the situation? Are you going to cause more problems? Now, by the way, Christ called the Pharisees vipers and whitewashed graves. He, he called them for what they were. You know, so that's not, we're not talking about overlooking an unrighteous person and, and making them look better than they are. We're talking about proper control of the tongue to where we're not allowing things to come out of our mouths that shouldn't be. Uh, James chapter 3 and verse 2. For we all stumble, and this word stumble is to lose one's footing, in many things, and we do, sadly, we stumble, we lose our footings, we got to get back up. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is mature. He doesn't say he's a perfect man. He says he's mature. And a lot of that maturity, by the way, especially with your words, you begin to understand the impact of your words to other people and what really is the whole focus of it. You know, another good example of, of this kind of a, a person who is growing and maturing is um, speaking to people in a way that doesn't consider whether they deserve it or not. Speaking with grace. You know, it's amazing how often that impacts the other person. And typically for the better. Because you're not speaking to them, you know, you'll get the person who's crabby and mean and nasty and they speak to you that way, but you don't speak to them that way. You grow and you mature and you begin to understand how that actually impacts everything. Not fearing because ultimately of love. What does mature love do in our lives? First John chapter 4 and verse 18. There is no fear in love, but mature love, that's your word perfect there. Mature love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but, we, but he who fears has not been made mature in love. As we mature, in, especially in understanding God's love, we are not going to have any fear at all. We shouldn't. You know, a good example, is, as Paul writes, you know, and I was thinking about Paul, especially in the situation, of course, with um, our government and everything else going on. You know, Paul lost everything, but yet he wrote in Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not tribulation, not suffering, not starving, not anything. Not an angel, nobody can come. You know, it's understanding who we are in God. And this requires maturity, you know. So if you're a little shaky on that, don't, you know, it's because you, you need more time to grow and understand and experience God and begin to focus on that rather than, oh, I just, I can't do this. I wish I was like this other person. You actually in Christ are just like all the rest of us. You have all the same access. You just have to begin to use it and grow and mature. And for now, we're actually going to uh, go ahead and take our break. Um, there is an interesting shift here in verse 14, but I'll get to that, I guess, next week, because he, he doesn't say, I write to you. He says, I wrote to you. So he shifts the direction that he's doing, and then we'll talk about the world system from there. So 